Oh, so, so, so lovely to be able to participate. I wish I could be there in person. It's a really long plane ride. So um, I'm gonna talk about the real making of God's Merits and the sort of this work that I've done recently and the questions that I think um, I still engage me. Um, and I want to begin with the cognitive science of religion, which I think is a place where many people in the room begin, um, which clearly is reaching towards something that is likely true. So this is the observation that the pressure of human evolution may well have created the conditions under which the idea of the supernatural becomes cognitively plausible. And again, it's really compelling. I take the basic argument to be this, that our ancestors were more likely to survive if they were alert to predators, if they were always alert to other humans, that our minds have evolved such that some thinking is quick and intuitive and automatic, and we're highly alert to agents and social cues. As a result, we automatically and intuitively infer agency and sociality, even when it's invisible. So I think that's likely true, but I also think that it doesn't explain how commitments are sustained. I think that the sustained, I mean, after all, if you, you know, you can infer that an invisible being is in the next room, you can go, you, know, you infer that the dog's not stepping over in the next room, and you go next door, and the dog's not there, and you change your point of view. To, to continue to commit to the presence of this invisible being, I think that you need ritual and prayer and special behavior and special stories, special buildings, special stuff. And my own work focuses in on two different phenomena. The faith, I call it the faith frame, and what I call kindling, which is sort of a, a, a way of capturing some version of thinking about belief, cognitive or epistemic stance, and the felt realness experience. And I think that the tension between the, the, the cognitive commitment, the belief, the faith frame, and whether a God feels real is, is, is deeply, is, this is a, the tension that's deeply real, deeply salient for people of faith. So even deeply people say that, you know, they, they, they want to believe all the time, they want to be conscious of God when they're washing the dishes and they're just not. People of faith talk constantly about, you know, you know that they go to church, they want to experience, they're committed to being like Jesus and they get into the car and yell at their kids. You know, deeply, uh, people often are talking about the fact that they keep forgetting that God is real or that God is there to be attending to that. And from my point of view, I want to point out that people of faith do not behave as if the belief commitment is true in the same way that ordi the ordinary world, the world of tables and chairs is real. My favorite way of describing this is to say that no one, even the most fervent of faith, no one asks God to feed the dog. Nobody asks God to write a term paper. There's always a kind of implicit within limits clause for the way that people experience, understand, systemically commit to, to God's reality. And that's a puzzle which is quite different from the felt realness of, of, of God. One of the things I want to point towards as we move forward is the observation that in, in my own work, uh, we have found that people systematically distinguish between 
cognitive framing of belief claim of, of religious claims, and cognitive framing of ordinary claims. So people will use the believe to describe ideas of God. I believe that Jesus is alive versus think to describe ordinary states of the world. I think I can't drive down the street because pg e has, has blocked, the, blocked the, uh, the flow of traffic. And we saw this uh, in this paper in five different countries. So I'm going to talk through this, you know, my general ideas about kindling that I presented recently in this book called How God Becomes Real. And what I'm going to argue is that I see five dimensions of the way that God is made to feel more real the way that god, that god is a, a god is kindled into existence and there's a story of a paraclysm, a proclivity a practice ferocity and phenomenology i don't claim that these are the only features they're just the features that i have something to say about and i want to say that these are I say that these are small ways of attention which shape the sense of felt realness of God's experience. First is the observation of faith, fair paracosm. Paracosm is the name for a shared imaginary world, uh, most famously the worlds that the Bronte children dreamed up together. But, you know, Harry Potter is Everybody knows the books, everybody can use them. One of the paradoxical features of a paracosmic world is that if it's detailed enough, people can remake it on their own. So the more detailed people know about, about Harry po Potter, the easier it is to have their own ideas about, say, whether Dumbledore was gay. I think that this is the way that people use the Bible, that they know the story so well that they can apply it to their early life, their, their, uh, to their own lives, or at least they're aiming to do that. They're aiming to read the story of the prodigal son and say, oh my goodness, this happened to me this weekend. In that paracosmic world, and I'm going to lean on Christianity because it's the faith that I've been studying most frequently, in that paracosmic world, there are rules about who's part of the community, who shares the world, rules for recognizing how spirit should touch, and rules about how to interact with spirit. And so in the case of charismatic Christianity, you have this, this, this God who's deeply human and a God who's deeply supernatural, and people will give you the implicit rules. They will tell you that but it's really under, important to understand that God is not an impersonal force. Even though he is invisible, God is personal, he has all the characteristics of a person. He knows, he hears, he feels, and he speaks. People tell you that you've got to learn to talk to God. And this is an ordinary experience for humans, but God's relationship with Moses is the normal life that God intended for us. And people come into a church like this and they learn to think differently about their mind. Not that their mind is private, but that thoughts and images and sensations might have understood self generated are actually God's. And so here's an example of how this works. I, here's a woman who's describing the experience to me. She says, I'm praying for someone. You know, they describe the situation that they want me to pray for. I start praying and, you know, I start trying to experience God. And now she's looking at her inner life. In her mind, she sees vivid images. She explains them to the person she's praying, to, praying towards. And the person to whom she's praying says, yes, 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 that's not you, that's God. And so people, are, and that speaks exactly to the issue that we're saying about. So people come to interpret their inner world as containing these communications from God. Okay, that's the story of the power cosmos. Sorry for closure. One of the things that I've seen again and again in my work is that 
the, the scale, the absorption scale developed by Telegan and Aki Telegan and, and his colleagues predict, to use that logical word, the experiences that I'm intrigued by. So there are 34 items. You say true or false. Does this, you know, does this sentence apply to me? Um, it seems to pick up somebody's personal orientation to inner and outer experience, a willingness to be caught up in experience, enjoy inner and outer sensory experiences for their own sake. And what I have seen again and again. Hello? We're here. We're here. Okay. All right. Um, it's, I, I thought somebody called that. Um, so I've seen again. What I've seen again and again is a weird echo. So I apologize for the kind of stilted mode here. But it, what I see again and again is that the more highly somebody scores on absorption, the more spiritual experiences they have, the more they say that God is present as a, as a person, the more they say that they have a relationship with God. And we've generalized this recently. There's a story about practice. So one of the things I thought I saw during the first middle-class folks in London who practice witchcraft, and then with the evangelicals, and then with many other kinds of faith commitments I've been involved with, is a practice in which people are using their inner experience to um, their inner senses to represent gods and spirits. And this helps the spirits to become more good. So people are sitting on a park bench and they're imagining gods all around them, or they're sitting in their throne room, or they're walking across a pit of fire to encounter protectment, or they're doing something, using their, their, all of their inner senses. And this practice has a long and rich history not only in the Christian prayer tradition, but in other spiritual traditions as well. And when I was doing this work with the magicians and with the Christians, people would say, you know, you've got to pray to experience God. They would talk about this inner sense rich prayer. They said that prayer is hard to learn and take to practice. They said some people are better than others. The ones who are good in practice change. Your mental imagery gets sharper, and I noticed that they had more cool, weird experience, experiences of God. And I and I thought that I could show in the work that this skill that sorry that became uh, that improved over time. I did this experiment, randomized people into this imagination-rich prayer, lectures and gospel. And, and the folks in the prayer condition were more likely to report sharper mental images, more sense of God's presence, more sense of God as a person, more unusual experience. I think there's a model of mind that helps people experience God more vividly. Well on this for a moment. There's, there's it's, it's I, I think that it is deeply human. I think this is true of all humans, um, although there's so much more to say about this that we have conflicting intuitions about how our mind works, um, that there's a kind of default model that thoughts are located somewhere inside, that those thoughts are kind of private, nobody else can see them, hear them, understand them, that you kind of generate these thoughts, and these thoughts don't do stuff in the world. Uh, that they, you know, they caught they, the thoughts affect the person. They don't affect the world. But it's really easy to generate intuition, even among everybody in the room, that there are times when that's not true. Even at these fleeting sense that there's that might not be true. But maybe after somebody's died, mentalish stuff can linger in the room. That people who are really close, like twins. Maybe when they're in trouble, one of them can, you know, one of them knows what the other is in need of. We're constantly saying, we often say things like, 
I, I don't know where the anger came from. It just swept over me. The poem came to me as if from somewhere else. You know, many people have a sense of really, really angry at somebody. Some of that anger might affect somebody at a distance. They might feel a little guilty, even if they didn't cause the car crash, if they were really angry at the person before, they, before something bad happened to them. I call these second groups of, of ideas, intuition, ferocity. And Kara Weissman and I recently wrote a paper arguing that these ideas are undergird religion, but they're not the same as religion. You can have a religious commitment without much richness and ferocity. You can have a, um, a, a porous intuition and not think that you are religious. So the process, the idea that the mind world boundary is permeable in non-ordinary ways. We did a study recently in which we were looking at five, five parts of the world. We gave people this uh, vignettes about in which we were doing a lot of open-ended exploring about, hey, there's this woman, Martha. You know, if Martha realizes that Mary is really, really angry at her, or caring at her for her, or really envious of her, can that hurt Mary? Or that help Mary? What does that do to have your, your, be, your, your neighbor have a strong emotion towards you? We had developed a porosity scale about how thoughts could be put in the mind or taken from the mind. And in this big project, we also asked people a bunch of questions about voices and visions and presence. And this is the, the probably our most comprehensive list. So the point here is that this was an interdisciplinary project. We used a bunch of different methods. We used open-ended conversation. We used short face-to-face -face conversations. And we gave people surveys. And no matter where we went, no matter how we asked the question, the higher somebody was in absorption, the higher somebody was in porosity, the more they had vivid experiences of gods and spirits. And that's where we published that. And the last thing I want to say about how gods and spirits are these tensions, or these, these means to kindle the sense of God, gods and spirits, is the observation that if somebody can have one of these odd and unusual experiences, it really matters because it is first person evidence that gods and spirits are there. And there's a kind of array of these experiences. Um, this is just some of them. The sense that heat is coming through your, your, your hand into the person in the center of the, the, the room, that, they, that you feel that powerful, powerful Holy Spirit. Or maybe you feel that the Holy Spirit has knocked you over, so that you're slain in the spirit, you go down to the floor. Maybe you feel that the Holy Spirit twists your tongue and you lost control of your mouth. So you speak in a way that doesn't sound like a language, but you think is a language that God can understand, but not the demon. People report voices and visions, vivid, sensory experiences that are not that other people don't experience, but feel more or less like seeing and hearing in their ordinary in their ordinary domain. People describe demonic presences. People told me that the, there was a demon in the corner of the room that quivered at them. People have senses of presence, a vivid sort of near sensory or near sensory experience that God is sitting right over there or that the Caridouin, back of the room, exactly where she is sitting. And there's a lot to say about presence. I think there are different kinds of presence. I think we're at the beginning of understanding the array of the phenomenological experience of presence. So one of the things I, I've done, I think that this is the claim of the kindling concept, a certain fluent and habituated for some of the time, and these patterns of events, patterns of events are different for different practices. 
So we're in the process of, sort of demonstrating that Christians compared to Buddhists, for example, and compared to actually a bunch of different things, have more interior experiences. Buddhists have more experiences of home. Um, they have more sleep paralysis experiences. Um, and again, they really matter. And that's where we publish that. Okay, so this is what I've been saying so far. There's a story of kindling in a way that real consciousness can feel, that have this phenomenological quality feeling more real that has to do with detail and the way somebody in the imaginative world somebody crafts for the religion, the proclivity uh, that, they, that they bring to the experience, um, the nature of their practice, their model of their mind, where they, they imagine their mind open to the world, and their phenomenology. I want to point out that this is a deeply social story. It's the social world that creates the paracosm, elaborates the porosity, um, models the phenomenology, establishes the context of believability. And I feel confident that in social worlds have commitments and have more intense practices, people are more able to have this vivid sense of realness. What this delivers to somebody is that God comes to be more experienced as person life. It's my favorite representation of the Christian the the, the, the God at the heart of the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, Behind. And then the spirit becomes a social relationship. And it's probably good. So I'm arguing that cognitive evolution will have to explain why invisible spirits feel plausible, sustain the plausibility of spirits must come to feel real. Real making is probably good for the individual mind and body, although I didn't walk down that path today. And maybe it's good for society as well, as with our neuroscience world work and the work of many of you, I think. Let me take just a few, some minutes to explain the many puzzles that I think remain. What exactly does this us about belief? I think that if we think about the epistemic as, as the faith frame, as the epistemic tag, and the kindling as a kind of quality of felt realness, I think one of the abiding questions is what is human and what is deeply cultural? So I know that Ingla Suri just a paper in which she was talking about uh, these, these um, role-playing folks who are real but not real. We don't treat them as people are experiencing them as real, but they're not treating them as real. There's something different about the claim about interacting with these quasi-games, even though they're really, really important, and living in a world in which they don't believe in a Christian God. And so one deep question is how cultural is the epistemic tag and how much difference does it make? One of the projects I've wanted to do, but hopefully we'll do in the next year or two, is to find um, you know these really committed Potter fan fiction folks, or maybe Tolkien fan fiction folks, and try to figure out whether the epistemic tag is connected to the realness, how realness being. My intuition is that it is. It may not be so much. We've done. We've recently done um, this, you know, two thousand subject big prolific story, and it's uh, and the, the the spiritual but not religious folks who have weak epistemic claims. I think have many vivid experiences. And so I think that this is really interesting. Here's another puzzle. Is practice one or many? 
So when I was doing my first flush of work, I was really focused on the fact that people were using their imagination to make what they imagined feel more vivid to them. So this is not a claim about whether God is imaginary. It's a claim about how people are using their mind. It is certainly true that part of the story is that they're also talking to God all the time. So what are the thing, questions? So let me so just back up to God. There is a deep question about the relationship between meditation and inner sense cultivation. The echo has disappeared. Are you still there? Hello? Hello? Can somebody yell out to me? Hello? Can you hear us now? Yes, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm not going to try to go back to a slide again. Okay, so let me say that one of the one of my long-standing puzzles is the relationship between what you could call apathetic prayer or cataphatic prayer or meditation and visualization. Um, more recently, I've realized that so I've been hanging out with people who make invisible friends called the, the, the people, the humans are called tulpamancers. The invisible friends are tulpas. And, uh, and so this is somebody's representation of their tulpa. Um, and they, these folks, um, clearly and precisely distinguish two kinds of practices. One is visualization and audiation. So they spend hours upon hours, eyes shut, imagining their tulpa, creating their tulpa, trying to listen to their tulpa with their mind's ear, and waiting for that tulpa to come to feel real, to start to assume its own form, and to go through what you might call a hierarchy of moments of realness. And people seem to have these like three or four moments where they say, ah, that the, the, the tulpa is more real at this point. This, you know, she, she spoke, or she pushed me, or she, she took off for a while and came back. But when, when the Talpamancers talk about what they're doing, they distinguish um, the visualization, the creative imagination work, the inner sense cultivation, and just talking to. And they say, you know, there's a second technique, which is easier. You just talk out loud to your Talpa as if your Talpa is present. They more or less say that you can't talk out loud on its own, that you need some kind of sensory anchor to make the talking out loud feel real. But I've become increasingly kind of puzzled and intrigued by the question of how many training domains or paths there are. Another big puzzle for me is what the Dickens is absorption. So Kara Weissman and I have recently been doing, so this is, Telegan thought this was a personality trait you thought it didn't change over the course of your lifetime. Um, I actually think that the domain of skills around absorption, like hypnosis, um, that there is a skill component to developing your 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 uh, your experience, um, having a deeper deeper hypnotized state. I think that absorption may be a skill as well. Kara uh, has found. That there are that if you do exploratory factor analysis, there are two. I mean, there's another set of arguments about exploratory factor analysis and absorption. But what Kara and I think is true is that there are two factors that really emerge, and that one of them is a story about vividness, and one of them is a story about the suspension of disbelief. What you what you might call sort of the felt realness of something and its epistemic stance. So I think that's kind of cool, and I'm puzzled about that. What really is porosity? Well, so part of the projects that I'm involved with now is trying to figure out the relationship between what you might call how much is really 
there, and there, it's a terrible frame. What is deeply human about our porous intuitions and what is culturally elaborated? So I expect that the idea that the mind is lo that thoughts are located in, in and for what I'm calling it the mind, but that the real commitment here is the idea that humans are conscious and that humans distinguish between the awareness of something like an inner awareness, consciousness, felt sense of thoughts and other stuff. And so thoughts, I think it's deeply human to kind of associate with that felt, felt inner awareness. I suspect that there's a default model of the experience of thoughts for humans. And that default model, um, which I expect is reached by late middle school, early high school, is that thoughts are located in, inside, that other people can't see them, that you generate them, and they don't affect things magically in the world. It's clear that there are, in different cultural locations, different intuitions are elaborated into social forms. So the most famous example would be ideas about malevolent witchcraft. So, you know, Evans Pritchard's story, <coughs> sorry, is a story in which intention malevolent intention, sometimes unconscious, can act to hurt somebody else's body. Ideas like that are common in agricultural societies. They serve a purpose. Um, so I, I think there's a story about how these ferocity intuitions are elaborated. I suspect there are also ferocity intuitions that are pretty human. So we have done some work to show that intuitions, that when thoughts are felt to be spontaneous, people are more likely to attribute them to an external source. So we've done this work, we haven't published it yet. I think we are also finding, although we're a little less confident about this, that um, thoughts are angry and maybe envious if they're powerful thoughts, and particularly if they're spoken thoughts, are, are more likely to be seen as supernaturally powerful. It's another piece of the story. The final thing I want to say is what is mind? Okay, that's a small question. So let me just ob observe that um, when I began this work, back in the dawn of time, I sort of imagined that the experience of mind for many, many people um, was that it was a vast, immaterial, internal universe. So that's, you know, what Augustine says. He talks about the vast caverns of their memory. And he talks about, you know, Augustine, he talks about our mind as if it has little wine buckets of memory. You know, you go in, you fish out a memory. Some of them are hard to find, but basically it's a big open cavern. You go in, you pick something out, and then you remind yourself of it. I have come to believe that that's not the way we experience the mind. And it's certainly not the way the mind evolved. So if, you, if we look at the um, theory of mind literature, it invites us to say, but the mind evolved in order to figure out what other people are thinking, that in order to kind of judge the intentions of other people, either caregivers or, or predators. And the more that I've, I've started to realize that in fact, my own mind is full of little commands, full of voices, it's full of what other people say. It's full of what I think other people say. And I, and I want to argue that one of the challenges of adulthood 
is sort of pruning those inner voices so that they are useful. So these days I spend a lot of time thinking about the voices of madness and the voices of spirit. Um, I think, I, I do not think some of our, our, my European colleagues want to argue that folks like Joan of Arc, people who experience God's voice more generally, they have an attenuated form of madness. I don't think that's true. I think that's much more basic is a model of a, a, an experienced mind that's full of voices. And sometimes um, for a whole array of reasons, some of which are madness and some of which are maybe epilepsy and some of which are the careful cultivation of the experience, sometimes those experiences pop out. And so this is the last thing I want to say, which is that I think that the, that, that the work of faith and the work of psychotherapy are often quite similar. And what they're doing is, in effect, helping people to cultivate a powerful inner voice, which is outside of them and is more helpful to them, more of a good guide, more of a useful guide, because it doesn't feel like just something you just thought up. It feels like a being outside of you that can give you good and wise advice. I don't mean to suggest that God is always good for people. I think there's excellent evidence that that's not true. But I think that I'm struck by the fact that this makes it possible. I'm noticing that these practices can help to create a good and useful external guide. Okay, so that's what I had to say. I'm going to end the show, if that's okay. And actually, some people should get out of this. And there you are. <laughs> Oops. Oh, no. OK. You're, you can still see me. Thank you, Jenny, very much uh, for your talk. And now, one, the last thing I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Also, you know, people watching online, please uh, ask your questions in form of comments uh, in your comment sections, whatever you're watching. And person, people in the, in the room, I'll ask you maybe to approach slightly closer so that you are closer to the microphone and also <laughs> so that Tanya can see you maybe more, you know, as something more than just a blur in the distance. Come down, please. Okay. <laughs> I really did think those abstracts were completely cool. Once the packet arrived, I was like filled with remorse that I wasn't there. Uh, hi, Tanya. Conrad Talman Kaminsky. Um, Good to meet you. Okay. I'm going to run an argument that I'm not completely convinced about, but I want to see what you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here we are in a deeply, profoundly Catholic country. Mm -hmm. right? And. I listen to what you say about real making, and it just feels to me like from a Catholic point of view, it just feels like a hell of a lot of work, right? I mean, you go to church, you do what the church tells you to do. What is all this heavy lifting with real making stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It feels a bit weird and foreign to a lot of the things that you think about when you think about the Catholic Church and that way of being religious. So how do you feel about that kind of response? So I actually think that Catholicism, first of all, involves a lot of heavy lifting. So if you're a truly committed Catholic, you're going to church every day. You're also probably praying every day. You're generating ideas about God. You are using, now, many Catholics do not use informal prayers. Some of them clearly did. The history of the Catholic faith, the earth, history of the Christian faith, and until it became the Catholic faith, is just rich with spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices. Ignatius Loyola, that kind of dominant model for the for you know my understanding of Christian uh, spiritual discipline, is a Catholic. So it's all there, and in fact, these evangelical practices were created by borrowing them from Catholics. 
I do think that there is both in Catholicism and in Judaism, um, and sometimes, in, and I think also in Christianity, increasingly this is true for evangelicals, there's a social dimension of participation and a, uh, a search for the felt realness of God. So somebody who is just like going to church once a week, you know, treats this as something you know you do as part of your identity. Um, that person might behave a little differently about their beliefs. That might still treat their Catholicism like an identity marker, but they probably they may not have a very rich sense of the felt reality, particularly of a loving God. So I do think that there's a, you know, there's a kind of continuum that gods that are mean to you are easier to believe in than gods who are kind to you. And so I would guess that even in a kind of socially country where maybe people don't go to a lot of length to engage their Catholicism, young people might have very vivid experiences of, of Satan. Um, but it's, anyway, that would be the, the I, I, there are many, many puzzles. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Black, please. Hi. Hi. This is Vladimir Bahna, and I would to ask you, we've been talking about the cultivation of a, in a sense, but what about cultivation of memories of experiences, like all the stuff about folk memory? Mm -hmm. It even opens much wider space for, for less, like the social impact and like uh, yeah. as, as the cultivation of inner science, I think. That's a great question. So I certainly think that the cultivation of you know, so so people can use these practices are not necessarily religious practices. The practices, you know, you find them in AI, you find it with these tough monsters, you find them with English uh, folks, you find them in gaming, you find them in 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 in, in fiction. Um, and I think the other thing is, I, I so when I see a distinction between the sort of the, the faith frame and the kindling. I think the faith, what I am struck with is that when something is an identified as more like faith, it sort of works differently. The people are less likely to reject the belief if they have a piece of counter evidence, and it works for them as an identity claim. So if you have an ordinary belief, like the coffee cup is on the table behind me, and I check it's not there, I kind of get rid of it. If I have a well instant, if I have a, um, you know, cl claim that I'm working for that, that, you know, God does not want me to have sex before marriage, um, that might be much harder for people to get rid of because it's become an identity claim and counter evidence might not daunt it or, or, or you know, Jesus rose from the cross, you know, so, so counter evidence that humans don't do that is not going to be good I'm not going to be a challenge for that belief. I think that that can also happen with that sense of identity formation that's impervious to evidence. I think that happened with QAnon in my country. I think it's happened with Trump. I think it's happened with uh, ideas about climate change. The ideas about climate change are no, no, no longer kind of so you know, they're, they're not being decided in a court of rational opinion. They become about who you are. And so I think that recovering folk memories, creating, you know, shared ideas about a community, those can also operate those ways. I think it's a really good point. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we will be now take a question uh, from the online audience, so you can see it wow. in the stream. Yeah. 
question is, I'm very interested in your opinions on the different factors differentiating some forms of psychotic episodes and some spiritual experiences. Could you elaborate on that? What a great question. This is the, the topic of my current book. And, this, and, and being able to see the question like that, I have to say, sells me on this particular technology. I always feel a little skeptical of new technologies when we have Zoom, but this I could not see this in, on Zoom. So this is very cool. Sorry, that was a digression. But um, so I think that there is a line between, or I think that not all ex religious experiences are psychotic. Uh, I think it's pretty hard to draw a very clear line. So I've talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folks who evidently and obviously and formally meet criteria for um, psychosis, often schizophrenia. And I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people who hear God's voice or feel God's presence and or you know, this presence of spirits, um, and, and you know, Santeria and and a Kung Fu in Ghana and witches in London and um, different kind and tulpamancers um, who have vivid experiences that and they are not obviously psychotic. Uh, so what are those differences? So let me tell you what I think these experiences share. So, uh, the, what, uh, uh, and particularly voice experiences, because those tend to be pretty basic and pretty common. So, when somebody hears, says, says that they hear a voice, there are three things that sounded very didactic. There are at least three things they share in common. One is that the experience feels like it's, it's uh, not me. That's what people say. How did you know it was? It was a. How how did you know that it was, the tapa? How did you know that it was a spirit? How did you know it was God? It didn't feel like me. Uh, and people with psychosis say this. That's the the nature of the of, of a voice. It wasn't, didn't have my voice timbre, but it's often more of a feeling. There's 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 this like this tag of feeling, and often people say that this tag of feeling uh, can't be put into words. And I think that's part. Of, that's actually less about your capacity to use words and more about the feeling itself, that there's something that feels not me, not, not word accessible. The second thing that's really shared is that um, these experiences are sometimes really clearly inside and sometimes really clearly outside, but they're often blurred, more often blurred. So people will say, I hear it out loud in my mind. He spoke out loud in my mind. I heard it with my ears, but it didn't make a sound. They're the, they're the, so they say weird things about it. And the third thing that's really clear about these experiences is that they are minds, or they have intentions, they communicate, they have purpose. The big, bold difference between people who are obviously ill and people who are not obviously ill is that the, for people who are not obviously ill, the experience is rare. Um, people can, like most of my Christians, they can remember one or two experiences. Um, they can also, they're typically brief. Somebody who's quite ill uh, can hear sentences and paragraphs and conversations. Somebody who's not obviously ill um, does not. Somebody who is uh, not ill is less likely to experience audible, you know, fully sensory experiences than the person who is ill. And the person who is ill is more likely to experience negative content. The voice is mean. And so, you know, you could say maybe that's just the, I, I, I think there are people who could be look a little floridly psychotic and have happy experiences. They don't come into the psychiatric consulting room, so they are harder to find. But typically, um, somebody who is um, having a spiritual, certainly if they are identifying their sense as a spiritual experience, they're much more likely not to describe it as mean. I mean, that's a little messy because you also have the demon in the corner, 
you have like St. Anthony in the desert, what was going on with St. Anthony, he's being beset by demons. Is that a psychotic experience? Is that a dissociative experience? Um, those are deep questions. So, so, I mean, so they're kind of, there's the question of, you know, obviously, well, not obviously ill and obviously ill. There are a lot of people in the gray area. There's the question of psychosis versus spirituality. And there's the question of psychosis versus dissociation. I also think that psychosis can be a pretty powerful spiritual experience. I think that people who, um, sometimes people say to me that their psychosis, which is obviously psychotic, they have voices screaming at them, saying horrible, horrible things to them. And they hate it and they've taken medication to deal with it. But people will sometimes say, this gives me an experience of God that is other people don't have because God is radically other. And, you know, and that is profound. Most people don't see that piece of God. So it's, it's a rich and complicated question. I should say that um, when the woman I'm thinking about most recently who said to me that her psychosis enabled her to see God differently, she said, there's a scene in Philadelphia, the movie. Is that a movie that means anything to anyone? No. Okay. I will ignore the scene then. Okay. But. Yes, yes. We, we, at least some of us probably are familiar with the film. Okay, so, so the film is about a man who's dying of, of AIDS, played by ten, Tom Hanks. And he it's early on in the, in the pandemic, people are really scared to be in his presence. And he's talking to his lawyer, because he's been Tom Hanks, the Tom Hanks character has been fired. The lawyer is uh, decided that he's gonna help him out. Lawyer Denzel Washington doesn't know how to think about this Tom Hanks guy. And there is a scene in which they're talking together early on in their relationship. And Tom, Tom Hanks is listening to an aria that is sung by Maria Callas. And in this aria, Maria Callas sings of seeing, it's a, the opera is about the French Revolution. She sings of seeing the place where her mother was killed, where her house was burned down, where her mother died to save her. And she starts talking about, um, you know, at this point you also experience the God of love, um, the, a, a voice of love. It's in the muck and the misery that their life emerges, that life will be mine. And then she goes and kills herself and gets killed. Um, and the scene in the movie, the scene is suffused with 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 red and it's extremely vivid and extremely powerful and Maria Callas's voice is just filling the room and this woman with psychosis said that's what it's like to experience psychosis and to be religious you see God in a way that nobody else does thank you uh, so are there any more questions from the room Yes, please, Krzysztof. Hi, uh, my name is Krzysztof Wierzchowski, uh, and uh, I have a question for because you mentioned that there are different classes of the kindling events, uh, and uh, that different classes of of kindling events yes. of this. Uh, and uh, that training matters, that you can train uh, yourself to, uh, you know, spotting the skin link events in the, in the world. Uh, and my question is about, um, can one train uh, himself to see from the seeing uh, God in this, uh, small things like goosebumps during the prayer, uh, mm -hmm. to having this huge animals event, spiritual event, like vivid hallucination. Can you, by training, uh, you know, gain this ability to uh, to to have this um, uh, this special uh, special uh, events in your life? 
And uh, mm, second question, uh, I have a second question about dreams. Uh, do you think that dreams are a good candidate for this uh, kindling uh, event? Oh, that's a really good question. So let me do dreams first. So dreams, um, one of the questions is whether is how, you know, are, obviously there are different kinds of dreams. Um, and some dreams really stand out for people, even if they're completely secular. And even if they're completely secular, some people will treat those dreams as having knowledge about the outside. Um, there's this really cool paper that demonstrates that even American, secular American undergraduates, if they dream, if they're about to go on a plane trip and they dream that the plane crashes, it will make them very anxious. It's like, so there, there's, there's something about dreams that uh, feels like comes from outside. Um, I mean, people have noted that. Uh, Edward Tyler thought that that was the source of the idea of the spirit, the dream. Um, so I think there are, I, in my work, I find three factors for giving rise to uh, cool, weird experiences. Uh, proclivity, um, practice, porosity. Um, training will, on its own, will make it more likely that people report a whole array of events, including dreams, you know, spiritual dreams, including hallucinations, um, including sleep paralysis. But I think what I see is true, and, and, and we're still trying to, we, so one of the next papers is going to try to do this. Um, I think what's still true is that if it's easy to have the experience, the training um, in which I'm including now what happens when you go to your group of people and people talk about how you know that God is there, like goosebumps. Like There are people who don't get goosebumps, but an awful lot of people get goosebumps. It's pretty easy for people to develop goosebumps that signal that God is present. I mean, some people don't do that. They talk about warmth or they talk about something else. I think when you get to out of body experiences, like the really the rare stuff, out of body experiences, sleep paralysis, um, it seems that um, training has has less of an effect. But it kind of depends on the on the research. So it, when Julia Cassanetti and I were looking at Thai Buddhists and American evangelicals. There's, there's a huge cultural set of ideas about sleep paralysis in East Asia. And in our small samples, we saw huge differences in, in rates. Um, in this other more recent five country study, sleep paralysis doesn't bounce around so much. It seems a little less impervious now. And that was true even in Thailand. I need to be con but I'm not totally confident of that yet. So my basic model is if the experience is sort of hard to have, training makes it more likely, but it's but it's but a little harder, a little less likely that you'll have the experience. Whereas the train if the experience is easy to have, training really, really makes a difference. And I and I tend to think that the way people talk about God's voice, you know, you know the, the hallucination-like experience of God is pretty common, but pretty rare. Like many people have it, but many have people have it infrequently. If like, hearing God's voice in your head and feeling that it's not yours, that's pretty easy to have. And being in, sort of culturated and trained and praying, people, that happens to people. It feels like God has spoken to them. Even so, the full-on hallucination is relatively rare, and people will say things like, um, you know, people, somebody's sitting with me, they're describing their experiences, and they're giving me a lifelong array of experiences, and people will say, oh, you know, that one, that was clearly God. You know, the others, maybe I, maybe I was interpreting it. So um, anyway, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. So I, I do think that pr prayer always makes a difference. 
but there's also a, a piece that the bodily constraints of the experience also play. I, I muted you. Have to, yeah, oh, I sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answer. You're welcome. Okay, is there, is there any other questions? Gabe? <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Gabriel Levy, hi. Uh, so we've been having this kind of lively debate over the past couple of days about basically about belief and whether we need the concept and, or how we deal with it uh, metaphysically, epistemically, ontologically, those kinds of issues. And so I'm just wondering about the faith frame yeah. And whether, just to get your reflection, since mostly it seems like you've been looking at like Protestant Christianity, and whether, well, I mean, that that's kind of your main area, whether that, yeah. the, the idea of faith, to, to me as a scholar of Judaism, it sounds very Protestant Christianity. You've probably heard this before, but I'm just wondering about your reflections on it, like it seems to kind of uh, reify belief, maybe, maybe not. And that might, that goes to the second question, which is about basically how far you want to push the line between the faith frame and the real or whatever the alternative of that is, like if a kind of dualism is set up, you know what I mean, between between the faith, the faith frame and the real world, or between sure. faith frame and kindling? Between the faith frame and and whatever is not the faith frame. So, like you, yeah. you step, you 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 make a choice to kind of step into the faith frame and out of the faith frame. And this is a very conscious co kind of cognitive thing that you're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's. Look, I mean, you're the belief guy. It's um, I, and I'm really impressed. I, I sort of hung out in the some of the belief talks that one of the Templeton groups sort of organized. I think it was um, Jonathan Chong organized these belief conversations. And what I realized pretty rapidly was that many people have elaborate, elaborate, philosophically sophisticated views about belief, and it's like you know not my domain, right? So is, is there a proposition? Is there not? And, you know, I, I, I sort of, you know, people generate a lot of propositions when you talk to them. You know, how many of those really kind of orient their inner thinking and frame their thought processes is, I, I think, is a complicated question. Um, it, for sure, Christianity... Re, you know, makes a lot about belief because in order to be a Christian, you must be able to have what Webb Keen and others have, have called, maybe this is Weber, called inner assent. So you must utter to yourself the sentence, I believe in Jesus Christ, and you go to church and that's what you say. Um, although you can claim for many Christians that is also a identity assertion rather than a claim about the world. I mean, I, I don't think that Christians mostly believe in talking snakes. Like that's not a helpful way to think about what it is to be a Christian. Um, so I think increasingly about the faith frame as an epistemic stance, uh, or Neil Van Leeuwen talks about it as a cognitive attitude, um, a way of committing to certain kinds of assertions and engagements. We have many, many cognitive frames, cognitive attitudes, epistemic stances. We imagine, we pretend, we believe, we want, we do all kinds of stuff. So um, the piece of it that I think I can notice is that uh, the, their talk about religion is often confusing 
because people who, who study religion and sometimes people who are religious be, sometimes think that what they treat as their claims are actually claims about how the world is. And I don't think people behave as if that's true. That's my primary commitment. And I think that's, that's true in Judaism as well. I mean, first of all, I think in Jude, I spent a year in an Orthodox shul as part of this process. And, um, and I think that what was true of the shul was also true of the evangelical church, which is that people have all kinds of ideas about, you know, what they mean by the word God. It's all kinds of different actual claims. And they have all sorts of different commitments by the frame when, when they say, when they thank God, for example. Um, those, cla those claims sometimes get caught up into identity more than other claims um, and become markers of what it is, you know, not all Jews care about the bugs and the broccoli. Some, some really do. That's, that's, you know, there are different ways of, you know, being a member of a group. Um, but the epistemic stance about gods and spirits I think that the, the, the observation that there's a different epistemic stance, that people ho cognitively hold talk about invisible beings differently than they hold talk about ordinary facts. I think that's true. So I think, and then I think it's true for Jews. I think it's true for Muslims. I think it's true for my magicians. They just talk differently about those, those beings. There's a lot of stuff they don't, you know, and, and so that that's the sort of the minimal commitment that I think I would make that that people and maybe it's not universally true. Maybe they're you know we sort of left open the possibility that in Ghana some people treat God as with the same cognitive frame as the world of tables and chairs. Um, but I think in general people treat God differently. Uh, you know, this is Paul Harris's work, Neil Van Leeuwen's work, uh, Rita Studi's work. You could claim. So, I th so but th those, th that's where I would, that's that's where I would come down. What what were the debates about? Um, am I muted? Uh, no, no, I just okay. uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm. Well, about whether we. Well, one would be whether we need the category of belief in, in cognitive approaches to religion, uh, which comes first, rituals or beliefs? Uh, yeah. uh, what are beliefs in the head or are they uh, yeah. somewhere else? So what role do they play in motivating behavior? Are yeah. they post hoc kind of uh, yeah. just uh, rationalization of behaviors or do they mm -hmm. actually cause behavior? And yeah, but we didn't come. I think there's disagreement in the room. Not, but, but thank you. I like your book. It's, uh, thank you. That, that's lovely. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question in the room? <laughs> Okay, so there's uh, there doesn't see there doesn't seem to be any more questions in the room uh, nor online. Uh, so yes, I think we can we can wrap up this session. Uh, thank you, Tanya, for joining us, and I really hope that you know during some future occasion we can meet uh, you know, in person. <laughs> and, yeah, these these yeah. Thank you for including me, even though the hybrid format is so odd. I feel we would have had rich conversations if, if I'd been there. I hope we will get to that, then. we'll have those. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for participating. And yeah, thank you. OK, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.